What is a modular monolith? We are seeing the resurgence of this architecture as kind of a middle ground between monoliths and microservices. However, modular monoliths aren't new, and in this video, I'm going to give you a high-level introduction into this architecture, but I'm also going to show you what a practical implementation could look like in .NET. As I mentioned, modular monoliths sit as the middle ground between monoliths and microservices. A monolith system represents a single executable application where all of the components inside contribute to the same functionality. All of the components are developed and deployed together inside of a monolith, and this kind of system tends to grow in complexity over time as the number of features in your application increases. A related concept to the monolith system is a modular monolith. This is still a single executable application, which is why I'm calling it a monolith. However, a modular monolith is different because it consists of logically separated components that are still deployed together, but are otherwise independent. So with this definition in mind, you can think of a microservices system as taking these logical boundaries or components and deploying them into separate physical boundaries. I'm not going to dive too deep into monoliths and microservices because I want to focus specifically on modular monoliths in more detail. So let's take a look at an actual example. Here's an oversimplified component diagram of an eShop application that contains one web API component and a PostgreSQL relational database. This should represent a typical monolith system because it has one executable application, which is deployed as a single whole, and a database that is running separately. Now, if we were to decompose our monolith system into microservices, we could end up with something like this. Instead of everything being deployed together inside of a monolith, now we have a microservices system where we have a few individual services running independently. So we have our catalog service, which contains the catalog component. This could be a .NET Core Web API, and it also has its own database. The same goes for the order service, the collaboration service, and the customer service. They are all deployed independently, and they communicate with each other using network calls. They could be using a RESTful API or a gRPC service, but these are implementation details. The important thing is that this is using a network request instead of in-memory calls, as was the case with a monolith system. There are many reasons why you would want to build a microservices system, and the two most common problems that this type of architecture solves are organizational issues inside of a big company. It's a common scenario that each microservice will be assigned to a specific development team inside of the larger organizational unit, and then you would have other teams in your company that will be responsible for the other services. So the one problem that microservices solve is organizational issues inside of a large company, which also ties into the logical separation of the components in your system that I also highlighted with a modular monolith. However, the logical boundaries are also elevated to the physical level because the services are deployed independently. The second problem that microservices solve is scalability. Microservices allow you to scale each service independently, which is a very powerful quality to have, and sometimes it's absolutely necessary and you can't achieve the desired scale inside of a monolith. So you've seen the monolith and the microservices diagram, but what would a modular monolith look like? Here's a representation of the same system as a modular monolith. Instead of having physically separated services, we are running only one executable application. So technically, we are still inside of a monolith system. However, there is a very clear distinction of the logical modules inside of the monolith system. So what we had as services in the previous diagram are now modules. So we have the order module, collaboration module, catalog module, and customers module. And you will notice that they are all using the same database under the hood. A quick intermission before I continue the explanation of modular monoliths. I'm actually working on a brand new course and the topic of this course is the modular monolith architecture. So if something like this would be interesting to you, you can sign up to the waitlist for this course from the pinned comment under this video, and you're going to be the first one to know when I release this new course. Thanks for bearing with me, and now back to the video. So how do we actually build a modular monolith in .NET? What we want to achieve in practice is the logical isolation between our modules in the larger monolith system. We are going to enforce this logical isolation by making the modules only talk to each other 
using a public API. I'm going to explain what this means in just a moment. The second rule that we want to enforce is that the modules are also isolated at the database level. And I'm going to talk about the different levels of data isolation inside of a modular monolith. If you think about it, what these two rules are actually trying to enforce is to prevent the tight coupling inside of a monolith system. And this is something that often happens with systems that grow over time and add more and more complexity and more and more features is that they become very tightly coupled. This means that whenever you make a change in one part of the system, you are inadvertently going to affect some other component in your system that you weren't even aware of. A modular monolith will solve this by declaring a very clear public API for each module. A public API for one module could be as simple as an interface in C Sharp. So what you're going to do is expose an interface from module B and is going to be made available to the module A. And then this module is going to be able to call the methods on this interface to interact with the other module. The implementation of this interface or the public API is encapsulated inside of the declaring module and you are going to provide this implementation at runtime. The benefit of this approach, which is using method calls to communicate between two modules, is that this is very fast, it's reliable and it's easy to implement because you will be using interfaces, it is also loosely coupled However, there is the concept of temporal coupling in this example because a method call is a synchronous operation. So you have to call the method and wait to get a response back. So you have to keep in mind that your modules are still temporally coupled and where the temporal coupling really starts to hurt you is when you try to extract one module into a separate service. Your method calls are going to stop working because you are no longer in a single process and you will have to replace the public API implementation with something that can talk over a network. So this is the downside of using this approach. An alternative approach is using messaging to communicate between the two modules. So now a message contract becomes the public API of your two modules. The messages could be commands that trigger something in the other module, or they could be events that communicate to the other module that something happened. And the communication would typically go through some message broker. Now, when you're running inside of a monolith, this message broker could be an in-memory bus, although this isn't recommended and it's not reliable because you could end up losing messages, which is definitely costly. So the disadvantage of using messaging is the increased complexity because you will have to manage an additional infrastructure component being your message broker. The benefit is that you are loosely coupled and this implementation will continue to work when you decide to extract a module into a separate service. If you are using messaging correctly, everything will continue to function the same because your modules can still continue to communicate using a message broker. So these are the two high level approaches, how your modules can communicate. But let's also talk about the data isolation between the modules. There are four levels of data isolation that I have identified. And this is the first one where you basically don't have any isolation between your modules. As far as the database is concerned, the data for your modules is going to be stored in separate tables, but you're still using the same database schema, the same physical database, and the same database type. In this case, we are using a relational database. And the reason you would want to isolate the data for each module is again to prevent tight coupling. So the next level of data isolation would be using a separate schema for your modules. So in this case, we are using a different schema for each module. For example, I have the orders module, the users module, and the finance module inside of my same physical database. And again, I'm using a relational database, which is the same database type. The next level of data isolation, if you need to take it further than the logical isolation that schemas give you, is still using different schemas, but this time you would be using also different physical databases to store the data for your modules. So now we have the order schema living in its own database, the user schema living in its own database, and the finance schema living in its own database. However, we are still using a relational database for all of our modules. And the last level of data isolation would be using a different schema, a different database, and a different database type. What this means is, for example, I decide that the orders module has a lot of unstructured data, 
so I might want to use a document database. And then for the users module, it's important for me to maintain the relationships between the different entities in my modules. So I choose to model this with a graph database. And then for the finance department, they want to use a tried and true relational database. So this was a high level introduction into modular monoliths, where I discussed how they are different from a typical monolith and a microservices system. I also stressed the importance of the logical isolation for the modules inside of a modular monolith. And I explained the concepts of a public API and data isolation for your modules. And now I want to show you what an implementation of a modular monolith would look like in .NET. Here I have a modular monolith system that contains three distinct modules inside. The modules are organized into folders and each module follows the clean architecture. Let's choose one of the modules, for example, the training module. And I want to start from the persistence project where I'm going to show you the database context for this module. What I want to highlight here is that the data for this module is stored inside of a specific schema. In this case, the schema name is training, which means that this modular monolith implementation is using logical separation at the database level to isolate the data for each of our modules. The module itself represents a cohesive group of functionalities or use cases that contribute to the overall functionality of the system. You can find the use cases for this module inside of the application layer. So here are the use cases that I have in place. And I'm using the CQRS pattern with mediator to implement the individual commands and queries. When it comes to the communication between the different modules in our system, in this implementation, I'm using messaging. Each module has an integration events project and inside of it, we have the individual integration events. So for example, we have an invitation canceled integration event, which is going to be published by the training module and the other modules in the system can subscribe to this integration event and then decide what they can do. The other integration event I have is the invitation sent integration event and it contains some contextual information about this event. This particular integration event is handled inside of the notifications module and this event handler is going to use an email sender for example to send an email notification to the client that they have a pending invitation from a trainer. I hope that you enjoyed this introduction to modular monoliths and if you want to learn how to actually build a modular monolith system from scratch, then you're going to love the new course that I'm working on, which is going to cover building a modular monolith. You can sign up to the waitlist for this course from the pinned comment under this video, and you're going to be the first one to find out when I release this course, and you'll be able to get it at the early bird price. Thanks a lot for watching this video, and until next time, stay awesome.